prayer. We're going to be looking today at Luke chapter 12, verses 49 through 59. To begin, I'll read verses 49 and 50, but I'm going to give to you a little bit of a review that goes back to chapter 11 in order that we can pick up here in chapter 12 at 49 and 50 and understand the context and, and <laughs> excuse me, what Jesus is saying as we look at this passage. So let's begin reading in Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 49. I'll read to verse 50. We'll get into our review and then move into our study. Luke writes in chapter 12, verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Now, Jesus has been speaking, and we've been following this particular train of thought since chapter 11, uh, at, beginning at verse 37. Jesus has been speaking and has been ministering a variety of things. You see, he had been invited to the home of a Pharisee. And while he was at dinner there with the Pharisee, as you'll remember, it's found in chapter 11, Jesus began to speak. And as he began to speak, he was clearly uh, speaking against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. So in his teaching, he made it clear that Pharisees were overly concerned with rules and regulations. He said they were more concerned about outer formalities, and they disregarded the spirit, the spirit of the law, the reason that God had given the word of God to them in the first place. And what they had done is they had made man-made rules. In the making of those man-made rules, though, they actually closed the doors to those who would enter into heaven. He had said in chapter 11, verse 52, Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. And so he's been speaking against religious hypocrisy, hypocrisy especially the rule-making Pharisees and the way that they did that. You see, the Pharisees were known to be those who lived for the praise of man, but they cared not for the praise of God, and they didn't care about other people. And so Jesus said, you care more about outer appearances of righteousness. That's revealed by the variety of things that you do. It's revealed uh, by, uh, by your concern about tithing of herbs. It's revealed by your forgetting the more important things of the law. It's revealed by the fact that you love the best seats in church and you thrive on public attention and recognition and how you load people down with soul-killing and burdensome rules. Now, as Jesus has been teaching this, there's been a result to his ministry. Sometimes we wonder, what is the fruit of Jesus' ministry? Well, in this particular case, the fruit of his ministry was people getting angry at his message. The people who were there, the Pharisees who were at that particular dinner party, began to verbally assault Jesus Christ and question him. They got extremely angry at him for the things that he was saying and all. It says in, in chapter 11, verse 53 and 54, as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say, that they might accuse him. That was the result. That's what happened as these people heard a message from the lips of Jesus Christ. Instead of saying, God be merciful unto us, we are sinners. Indeed, this is true. We have loaded people down with burdens that we ourselves won't, won't even use a finger to lift from them. It, it's true. We do tithe mint and herbs and all kinds of things, and we have forgotten the weightier things of the law. We, we have disregarded justice. We have disregarded love, and, and in this we, we have sinned, and therefore we're sorry. They didn't act that way at all. They were absolutely the opposite of that. They got so upset at him that they actually began to entangle, or at least to try to entangle him in his speech. They wanted to find fault so they could form an accusation against him. That's what happens sometimes when people are convicted, when they hear something in the Word of God that, that pierces them. Rather than saying, that's true, God forgive me, we can have a tendency sometimes of defending ourselves and, and pointing a finger back at the person that we feel is pointing a finger at us. And so instead of hearing the rebuke, and instead of repenting, they tried to get to him. Now, in the meantime, as it says in the beginning of chapter 12, in verse 1, a, a large group of people had gathered together to hear what Jesus was saying. And, 
And Jesus had stepped outside of the home of this Pharisee, and, and the crowd has formed around him. And the Pharisees are continuing to ask questions, and the people are now pressing around so that they might hear what he says. It's probable, as I mentioned to you before, that the people crowding around him would think favorably of the Pharisees. And so they're the ones who are in the most danger, and that's why Jesus begins to speak in the way that he does. These people need to hear what he has to say. And so, so he encourages them, and, and he begins to teach them. And, and actually, what he does is he encourages them to pursue that which really matters. Remember in chapter 12, verse 31, how he says, seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Rather than like, being like that man in the parable that he gives in the first portion of chapter 12, a man who thought that his life consisted in the abundance of the things he possessed, Jesus said the first thing that, that you really need to do is to seek to have a relationship with God. And, and have fellowship with Him and, and love the Lord with all of your heart. And, and the things that are necessary will be given to you. God will supply your need. He doesn't supply your greed, but He does supply your need, and He does so abundantly. And so pursue the Lord first and pursue the things that really matter because, as He said in verse 23, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. It, it's, it's much more than the outer appearances. It's much more than what you're wearing today or what you're driving today, even what kind of home you live in, what neighborhood you have, or what kind of diploma you possess. It's much beyond all of those things. Life actually consists not in the abundance of the things you possess, but rather in a relationship, first with the Lord and, uh, and those whom you love the most. And so that's what he's been saying. He's been saying to them, you need to pursue those things that really, really matter. And so, as he's doing so, he begins to minister. He ministers to them these things so that they might enjoy the Lord and, and enjoy having fellowship with him. He closed that portion by exhorting his disciples to live in a state of readiness. He's preparing them and has been preparing them for his death, his burial, and his resurrection, but now he is also preparing them for his return. He had made it clear that he was going to die and all because he had spoken concerning Jonah, and he had said that in chapter 11, verse 30, and he had said, as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So he already had appealed to the reality that Jonah, who was a sign to the Ninevites, is also a sign in that Jonah was in the belly of that great fish for three days, and all Jesus would be in the bowels of the earth for three days. So he's already alluding to the fact that he's going to die, that he's going to be buried, that he will resurrect. But he is also saying, listen, because that is true, you need to be ready. So last time we were together, we looked at verses 35 following, and we saw how Jesus gave parables uh, rela relating to his return and all, and we looked at those closely last time we were together. He's basically saying, be in a state of readiness because I'll return. And what you need to do is you need to be busy serving Jesus Christ until he returns. You're to be a faithful steward. You're to await the return of your master, even as one awaits the return of their master from a wedding feast. And if you're faithful, you'll receive a great reward. But remember this, you have been given great things, and therefore you're going to be held most accountable. So this is where we come now as Jesus continues to speak in verse 49. And so he says in verse 49, I, I came to send fire on the earth, and, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. I came to send fire on earth. Jesus tells them his purpose. Why did you come, Lord Jesus? Well, here he's, he tells us why. He says, I came to send fire on the earth. Now, as we think about fire, we need to remember that fire basically does two things. Fire consumes and fire purifies. So, Jesus is speaking about fire in that sense. I have come and there is a certain reality to the fire that is hitting the earth. One, it consumes, but two, it also brings purification. What I want, he's saying, and you see that in verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with. What he is saying is very simply this. I have a work, a work of salvation, a work of salvation that soon will be completed. I'm going to be crucified. And when I am crucified, my death is going to satisfy the righteous demands of my heavenly Father. My blood is about to be shed. I'm about to be buried. But I will arise on the third day and I will send the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to purify. He will purify believers. He will empower believers, and he will set the stage for ultimate judgment. 
One of the things that we need to understand very seriously, especially in these last days, is that we can get caught up having an outer appearance of righteousness, even as Pharisees did, to be known by the things that we do not do and not be known by the things that we do. Many years ago, I was reading a book, and it was written by a man by the name of Francis Schaeffer. And Francis Schaeffer was pointing out something that I'll repeat, I'll basically paraphrase, but in reality, he was pointing to the fact that, that the mark of the Christian always has been love. It always has been. There's a birthmark that we have that God has given to us. It's the mark of, of our, our Father, and, and that mark is the mark of love. And, and, and it's been said that were you to have spoken to somebody in the first century, and were you to have spoken to them in this way and asked them this question, if you'd have said to a first century individual, can you tell me what a Christian is? You'd have gotten a lot of responses, but what they would generally have ended up saying is this. They would have ended up generally saying, Christians... Yes, we know who Christians are. Christians are the ones who follow that one name, Christ, Christus. And if you said, yes, that's true, they're followers of Christ, but what do you know about them? They would have said to you, those are those who love. It was well known in the Roman, in the pagan community, that Christians loved each other. As a matter of fact, it was so well known that that was actually looked at as being unnatural. And some of the philosophers and those who argued against Christianity during the first century actually would say that Christians were unnatural. They had unnatural traits about them. They have a weakness about them. It was called humility. To the pagan, humility was something that was really a weakness. And they also loved strangers. They even have things that they have written where you can read some of the ancient writings of the historians and all, and, and they will say things like, these people are very unusual. They even love strangers, and they call strangers brother and sister. And some of them would go so far as to say, that makes them an incestuous group of people because how can a brother marry a sister? And they use that as an argument against the, 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 the philosophy of Christ and the lifestyle of Christians. But in the early days, if, if you were to ask somebody, what is a Christian? They would have said, it is somebody who loves. That's what Jesus had taught us, isn't it? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever. I have commanded you. And so the mark of the believer from the very beginning was love. He who loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another. And you see that from, from book to book, from chapter to chapter, and that all comes back to Jesus Christ. And so as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been called by God to walk in the power of His Spirit. I cannot love without God's Holy Spirit within me, giving me the ability to love beyond my natural abilities to do so. You see, like Jesus on one occasion said, He says, well, if you love those who love you, what makes you any different than the average person? A publican does the same thing. They love the family members. They love those who love them. You have to learn to love your enemies. You have to learn to lay down your life for those who don't love you because that's a greater love. That's the kind of love that God had for the world when he gave his son Jesus who did that for us. We were his enemies. While we were yet enemies, uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, Christ died for us. And so we at one time were rebels against him, enemies against him, and out of love for us, God so loved us that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross before we had been reconciled to him as a demonstration of the depth of his love. And therefore, as believers, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who purifies our lives and the Holy Spirit who empowers us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in order that we might be able to do the things that are pleasing to God. I cannot please the Lord without his help. I need the power of the Spirit. That's what makes Christianity different than any world philosophy, is that God will give to you a command Love your neighbor as yourself, and then he gives you the ability to perform that command by supplying to you the energy, the Spirit, which enables you to do that. And so as an evidence that you're walking in the Spirit, well, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so as we have a relationship with God, we're being purified. Our lives are being transformed because fire does that. Fire has a way of purifying it. It cleanses the dross 
And we also are receiving power from the Holy Spirit to live for Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ says here, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with. How distressed I am till it is accomplished. And so he's saying, I have something that I have come to do. I have a task that I have come to accomplish. In verse 50, he calls it a baptism, a baptism to be baptized with. All of these things, this purification, this work that God is going to do, this, this uh, making people aware of their sinfulness so that they can receive Christ and be forgiven, all of this hinges on, on his death on the cross. And that's why he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. It all hinges on his giving up his life. Now, the question has been asked, didn't Jesus enjoy himself while he was on earth? I mean, could it be that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was saying, Lord, take this cup from me, could it not include the fact that he simply enjoyed being alive, walking on the earth, you know, enjoying fellowship with human beings and all of that, and that perhaps he would even miss uh, walking as a human being and all? Well, Jesus would answer that question here, and he would say, no, that's, that's not it at all. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am distressed until it is accomplished. I have something on my heart, the reason that I came, for this purpose that I came, and it's my great desire to fulfill that which God sent me to do. So, no, I don't want to remain behind. I want to die on the cross for you. But it's interesting how he speaks about being distressed. That word distressed uh, speaks of his being in anguish. I have an anguish that I'm about to endure. And this is what's occurring as he's thinking ahead of the suffering he's about to endure. That word distressed means to press together, to be held completely. It can speak of a prisoner who's in bondage. It also speaks of that one who is afflicted. It can speak of being constrained. And so what he's saying is, my mind is on this one thing, and the one thing that my mind is on is the baptism that I have to be baptized with. The one thing that my mind is on is my death. The fact that I'm going to be taken, I'm going to be tortured, I'm going to be placed on a cross, and I am going to brutally die is on my mind constantly. And yet, I desire that to take place. And that's what he's saying in verse 49 when he says, how I wish it were already kindled. I have a desire for this to be done because I have come to do your will, O God, even as it is written in the volume of your book. In John chapter 12, at verse 27, Jesus said this, he said, now <clears throat> my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Am I saying, take me out so that I don't have to do this? No, I came in order to accomplish this. The cross is before me. I have chosen to embrace it. It is my desire to die in order that I might pay the ransom price. I will pour out my blood, and in doing so, I will bring many people into a relationship with the Father. So I'm distressed, yes, but I desire for this to be accomplished. In Mark chapter 14, verses 33 through 36, Mark writes how that Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And so he said, I came to send fire on the earth. I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. How I am distressed until it is accomplished. This is what I have come to do, to embrace that cross. And even though I would desire another way, there is no other way. And therefore, I am going to do what my Father called me to do. He sent me to do. This is the purpose that he sent me with, and I will accomplish it. I will embrace that cross. I will die. But you need to know this. Do not let my life be given in vain. May the Holy Spirit purify you, and may the Holy Spirit empower you so that you can be transformed by that sacrifice in order that you might be able to go out and do the same thing that I do. Give out the Word. Lay down your life for others in order that they might enter into the kingdom of God. 
He continues in verse 51 and he says this, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I heard a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law say amen just now. How come on? <laughs> now, this is to me interesting, and I want you to see this with me. I want you to see verse 51. I'm going to spend just a moment there, but I want you to see this. In verse 51, he asks a question. Look at the question with me. He says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Do you know that the average person today would say, yes, I suppose that? They would say that. Yes, yes. If you're a Christian, aren't you supposed to bring peace on earth? I mean, didn't we just recently hear this during the Christmas season? Don't we hear that every Christmas season? The, the, Jesus Christ came so that he could bring peace on earth. Didn't he say peace on earth and goodwill toward men? Well, then what's going on here and all? Well, look what Jesus Christ said. You need to see this. You see, when we've studied the passage there that speaks concerning peace on earth and goodwill towards men, literally it is and, and, and goodwill uh, and peace to those who are men of goodwill. What it speaks about is that people who have goodwill in terms of relationship with God and others, those are the people who are going to enjoy the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. But peace is not going to occur without the Prince of Peace. Here's the problem, though. People think that Jesus Christ came so that we could all just get along. And the point he's making is, well, that's not really true. And some of you in this room understand exactly what he's talking about here. Some of you know that. You're living that situation right now. We have had people over the years, for the many years, who have come, some escape from circumstances as they come to a Bible study on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night or a, or a Sunday morning or whenever we have opportunity to gather. Some are actually literally escaping from situations. They're coming from homes that are filled with anger and bitterness and confusion and division. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that somebody came to Christ and, and perhaps the husband or the wife didn't appreciate that or the children are chaotic because the parents are now trying to walk with Jesus and the kids kids don't want to. I've had kids who have rebelled against their parents, and the parents have come and spoken to me and have said to me, you know, my kids have said they like me better as a drunk. They don't like me now that I'm a Christian. They liked me better because I was harmless. I was happy all the time, they thought, and they could get away with whatever they wanted. And now that I'm sober, and now that I'm walking with the Lord, and I'm trying to, to bring Christ into the house, they don't want to come to church on Sunday. They get angry at me because I'm too involved. They don't like the way that I've, I've turned out, and they're angry. I've heard that many times over the years. Or a husband who liked his wife in a certain way, and, and she got saved, and she began to change. She used to go with him out to Vegas. He used to do the things that he wanted to do, and she didn't have a problem with that. She'd go to the bar. She'd go out to the dances, do all the things that he wanted. Now she doesn't want to drink anymore. Now she doesn't want to take the money and gamble anymore. Now she wants to serve the Lord and the husband gets upset. It happens all the time. So a kid gets upset at his parents or the parents get upset at the kids or a husband will get mad at the wife. The wife will get mad at the husband. A mother-in-law will get mad at the daughter-in-law and say, what happened to you? You changed and then you changed my boy and now my boy isn't going to my church anymore. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you are living through that right now. My son was raised in this church. He was baptized in this church. He received his communion in this church. He was confirmed in this church. And now he's going to that Protestant cult. What's going on? We've heard that numerous times. We've received phone calls from parents who were upset. What did you do to my son? And one lady in particular, I still remember to this day, who called up and said, what happened to my son? I could handle him as a druggie, but I can't handle him as a Jesus freak. And they get upset over that. They get mad over that. Jesus said that's what's going to happen. But notice how he begins here. He says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather divisions. Now, during this time, there was a common theological belief that was held by many religious Jews. And in this belief, and let me outline it for you. It'll take a moment to do. I've gotten it written down, so I'll read it to you. During this time, there was a basic set of expectations concerning the Messiah and what would relate to Messiah. They believed first that before Messiah would arrive, there would be a time of terrible tribulation. Then, before the coming of Messiah, there would be a forerunner who would be sent, a man like Elijah, and third, after those two events, Messiah would appear and would immediately establish his kingdom. Now, the unbelieving nations would ally to fight against Messiah, 
but the nations opposing Messiah would be destroyed for their opposition. After that, Jerusalem would be restored and would be the city of the great king. The Jews who had been scattered throughout the earth would be regathered to Israel. Israel would then become the center of the world, and all nations would be subject to Messiah. After Messiah began to rule, the earth would enter into peace and joy eternally. So they're looking at Jesus, and they're saying, aren't we supposed to have peace? Because if you're Messiah, you should be fitting into our eschatological mapping of how things are supposed to be, our last day scenario. And, and shouldn't we be having peace right now? So Jesus is actually correcting that because something they didn't see was the, the um, birth of the church. They didn't realize that God was going to reveal a mystery that Paul speaks about in the book of Ephesians when he speaks of the mystery of Jesus Christ's church who is the bride of Christ. They didn't see that mystery. It wasn't revealed in the Old Testament to them. They had the scriptures but did not see that God would become flesh as he did. And so when Jesus came as Messiah, they were not anticipating a new work where Gentiles would actually be brought into the family of God. That's why uh, race in, in Scripture is interesting because in the Old Testament, you have people, humanity, divided into two. You have Jew and Gentile. From Genesis on, as you begin to read the Bible, you see that being revealed that ultimately when the nation of Israel comes into existence, you have Jew and Gentile. But in the New Testament, humanity is divided into three. You have Jew, you have Gentile, then you have the church, which is the one new person. So from the Jews and from the Gentiles, God has created what is called the new man, which is actually taken out of both the Gentile nations as well as the Jewish nation. Nation, And now, whether Jew or Gentile, if you have Jesus as your Messiah, you become one in him, and therefore a Gentile can be a brother to a Jewish person based on their faith in Christ. So the church was not shown to the uh, Old Testament saints the way it is revealed in the incarnation of Christ. And that's why Jesus is speaking here and he's saying, uh, do you think, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? He's actually speaking about the common belief of his day that, that he was supposed to usher in peace. But then he goes on and saying, not at all, rather divisions. And then he tells them the kind of divisions as we read a moment ago. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is going to bring division. Instead of, instead of us uh, becoming unified, he's saying, instead of homes being unified because somebody's a believer, in reality what's going to happen is you're going to have some problems. You're going to have problems in your house. You're going to have problems in your family because devotion to Jesus Christ instead of unifying, sometimes creates great schism, great division. I was listening to a great philosopher the other day. Uh, she was on TV, Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> She's a likable woman. She really is. But I happened to hear her actually... I don't even remember. I wasn't watching the actual program. It was a tape of something that was shown later on during the day on a news program. But Hoopy Goldberg is on a, a show called The View. Some of you are familiar with it. Perhaps you watch it, The View. And, and she was discussing faith in Christ with uh, Hassel, I don't remember her name, Hassel Hoff, is that it? Hassel man, Hassel, Hasselbeck. Um, see, I know. Uh, but anyway, my favorite show. But she was talking to this young lady who's a believer about, about intermarriage, about marriage of people from different religious faiths. And they were discussing the reality of if a person is not a Christian and they marry somebody who is, then how are you going to raise your child? In what faith will you raise your child? Some of you people understand that argument, by the way. Some of you people go through that. Some of you have in, in, endured that and understand that very well. You married somebody that doesn't share your faith. And, and so, how do you raise them? And that's what they were talking about. But what I found it was interesting is this, is that Whoopi was saying, um, she's saying, 
Why not just give them an opportunity to decide what they want later on in life? And you see, the problem is, is that's the common way people think today who don't know the Lord. They don't understand the depth of religious faith. You see, the, the conflict that we're having in the world today between the fanatic Muslim radicals and all of that, uh, it's, it's religious in content. It, it, there's a religious base to it. There is a spiritual motivation to it. And, and that's where people who are, who are not committed to any religious faith at all or those who are committed lightly or in name only, that's where they miss. That's what they miss. They don't understand that. And uh, the fact is, is if I'm a, a genuine believer in Jesus Christ and actually read the Bible and believe it and actually try and do that which God calls me to do, it is going to cause division. There's just no way it's not. It is going to cause division. Because as I read the scripture and I see Jesus making these incredible statements and all, um, if I believe those things, it's going to change the way that I live. I mean, here's some things that, and I won't give you a lot of things. Here's, here's some things that, that you have to deal with if you're a Christian and all. Uh, people, people really have a difficult time with this. Um, in, Acts, uh, in Acts chapter um, for the Bible says salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There's no other name given in heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name. No other name. The, it, Jesus in John 14, 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Or, or, or Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, there's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. So when you see things like there's, there's no other name, when you see that there's only one way, Jesus himself saying that, when you see Timothy being told by Paul, don't forget there's only one mediator, if you really believe that, if you, if you really do, I'm assuming we who are in this room as Christians that we do, then how can you say that Buddha is equal to Jesus? How can you? Can you? Can you, in your religious class, your, your classes that you take in secular college as I have, comparative religions and all, can you, can you say, oh, yeah, well, Muhammad had some teachings and Jesus had some teachings and, and the Hindus have some teachings and they're basically all the same? Can you honestly say that? Well, of course you can. You see, there's an exclusivity to your faith in Christ that does not allow you to say that Buddhism is equal to Jesus Christ or that the Muslim faith is. There's an exclusivity. Now, that doesn't mean that that is a, a war mantra. So we go out and we pull out the sword and we start fighting, and if you don't convert, we cut your head off. That's not what it is, because it's a battle for the heart. It's a battle for the soul. It's a battle through the power of the Spirit, through the gospel and the message, and it's especially a battle that is fought in love and prayer, love for people and praying for them and, and all of that. And, 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 but the fact of the matter is, is that there is going to be conflict. And that's what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. If you're not with me, you are against me. Everybody in this room knows Greg Laurie. All of us know him. His ministry is a wonderful ministry, anointed by God, has been for many years. And, and Greg has shared on, on occasion when he gave his testimony how that, that he was at school and, and he heard an evangelist who had come onto campus and the evangelist there, the Christian guy, was sharing. And, and as he was sharing the gospel, during his presentation of the gospel, the evangelist said, either you are with Jesus or you are against him and quoted the scripture I just read, Matthew 12, 30. And Greg Laurie says that for the first time in his life, he realized that since he was not with Jesus, all along he's been in opposition to him. And he said that pierced his heart and, and made him realize that, that all along he's been scattering rather than gathering. And that was the scripture that spoke to him that drew him to salvation in Jesus Christ. That scripture that awakened him to the reality that you're either with him or you're against him. There's no neutral ground. There's no in-between. There are no pacifists in this spiritual war, you see. Either you're for the Lord or you're against him. And that's scripture. That's why the Bible says, choose this day whom you will serve. And that's why Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
So there are choices that are made, you see. And Jesus is speaking about that. And so he makes that very clear. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather divisions. Because when you actually fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, your home can actually be divided. Division. The word division speaks of that which is complete and often permanent separation. It speaks of being divided into opposing parts. This is one of the reasons why some people uh, hesitate to say yes to Jesus Christ because they're aware of the fact that they may lose their friendships, they may lose their family. You know, this church first began, we used to meet in a place, small place on Vine Street in the city of Ontario. It was called the Church of God Seventh Day. And... Uh, I was teaching there on a Sunday morning, and the church was, was, was small. We had maybe 60 people in church at that time. It was in our church was, was in its first few months of existence. And so I still remember as I was there, I, I didn't give invitations on Sunday morning. I knew every person who showed up. I knew everybody. They were all sinners, you know, but no, I knew them all. But at a certain point, I started thinking, I ought to give an invitation. I should probably give an invitation. I hadn't given an invitation. And so, one Sunday morning, I remember giving an invitation. If, if anybody in this room needs to get right with the Lord, then I invite you as we bow our heads, you know, raise your hand. And, and, uh, and uh, somebody did. And, and I said, come forward. And there was one person, a young lady named Tracy. And she came walking forward, and she stood right in front there, and I prayed with her. And, and afterwards, she walks out, you know, with a, a follow-up minister, and, and I was there talking to people, and she spent some time with this follow-up guy, and then she came walking back in. And she walks up to me and starts to speak to me, and she said, uh, she said, David, could I, could I ask you a question? And I said, sure. She said, look at I just, as you know, I just gave my heart to Jesus, and, and I'm born again. And I said, isn't that wonderful? She said, it is, but I, I have a, a problem I need to ask you some, some direction on. And I said, what is it? And she says, well, I have a boyfriend. His name is Frankie, and Frankie's in Oregon. He lives in Oregon right now. She says, uh, he's not a Christian. So what am I supposed to do now that I'm a Christian and my boyfriend's not a Christian? What am I supposed to do? I said, well, Tracy, what I would recommend you doing is, is uh, one, give him a call. Call him up and speak to him. Tell him what you did today, how you gave your heart to the Lord. And, and tell him how important it is that, that he gives his heart to Jesus Christ. Now, if he doesn't give his heart to the Lord, then he's an unbeliever. You've committed your heart to Christ. The Bible says you're not to be involved with unbelievers. And therefore, the second thing you'll do is, is if he doesn't give his heart to the Lord, then you're going to need to break up with him. And she says, is that, that's what I'm supposed to, I said, that's what the Bible teaches. We're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And so, if you're going to follow the Lord, you need to make a, a, a complete dedication to him and, and see what God does. Tracy, but call him up and talk to him. Well, I see her the next week, and she says, you know what happened? And I said, what? She says, I called Frankie up. I said, yeah. She says, and, and I'm speaking to Frankie on the phone, and I said, Frankie, I got to talk to you about something. And he says, well, wait a minute. Let me tell you something. He says, today, I, I didn't have anything to do. I went to church, and, and Tracy, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ today. And do you know what? They started, they, they, he came back, they, they stayed together. I performed their wedding for them, dedicated their children for them. And, and Frankie's now in Virginia, and he's planted a church there. He has a Bible study. You see, you don't always see it divided. Sometimes God brings it together. So don't be so afraid. I mean, if you're out there saying, oh, I'm going to lose them, maybe you should, you know. But that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's another subject altogether. But... See, but the fact is, is that sometimes you do. And Jesus said, that will happen. But there's got to be something greater uh, that motivates you, and that is the pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is worth following, whatever the cost may be. Psalm 27, verse 10 says, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. 
In John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You will have peace in me, but in the world you won't. So just put your trust in me. Now, obviously, if you're going home to somebody who doesn't know the Lord, you need to ex exercise wisdom. Don't go out of your way to intentionally agonize anybody. I mean, sometimes people have heard me give my testimony where I have said that I spoke to my dad and I said to my dad, Daddy, you're a good man. You're the best man that I'll ever know, but you'll be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Daddy, I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're going to pray and receive Christ with me right now. And, and many people have heard me share that because that's what happened. And my mom and my dad both bowed their head, received Christ, and my dad followed the Lord until the day he went home to be with Jesus Christ. So some people say, well, David says that. I'll do that. Go home and say, Dad, you're going to hell. Wow, no, you don't do that. <laughs> Your dad may not be like my dad, you know. My dad wasn't the average guy. My mama is not the average woman. They, they, they gave me permission to speak my heart. I had the freedom to do that. And, and my home is that way and was that way. And so you may not come from that. You might go home and try that, and they'll get even angry at you. No, be very careful. Listen, if, if you don't have their permission to share with them, then, then win them without a word. Win them with the content of your life and, and wait to earn the opportunity to share with them. We have kids who say, my parents aren't going to, are going to hell. They don't listen to a thing I say. And, and if they're, you know, young kids, I'll say, really, do you clean up your room when they tell you to? Why would I do that? Well, 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 well if you're telling them how to get to heaven and they can't even find your bed because there's so much trash in your room... <laughs> You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about going into the backyard and doing some work when your dad's mowing the lawn? You ever thought about getting out that old weed whacker and helping him? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about putting your faith into action? Or do you think it's just holding a Bible shouting at people that they're going to go to hell if they don't ask Jesus into their heart? Live for the Lord in such a way that it's winsome, in such a way that it's attractive, in such a way that they begin to wonder what happened to you, and then you have earned their ear so you can explain and if they don't give you an opportunity to explain, you can continue to pray. Seek the Lord, perhaps a co-worker, a friend, a family member, somebody on TV or a radio program might reach their heart. But Jesus made it clear, some people are going to completely and finally reject you, and that's the way it is. Continuing on, verse 54, he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming in, so it is, and when you see the south wind blow, you say, there's going to be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Yes, and, and, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge. The judge deliver you to the officer. The officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. And so in verse 54 um, to 56, Jesus is simply saying this. You can predict that which is natural, the weather, but you cannot even see the signs of the time. And that's true today. We have experts that predict trends in every area of our lives. We have those who are stock market experts and fashion experts and entertainment experts and music experts and child care experts and marriage experts, family experts. We have people who are experts in the trends in education and politics, ecology, real estate. We even have people who chart the trends in religion. I mean, we have people who are experts in all kinds of things. But the point is, is people can be capable of identifying trends, but remain, spirit, uh, remain blind to spiritual truth. So Jesus says this is hypocritical because you pretend to understand, but in reality, you're not even noticing the times. You can see, but you are unwilling to discern. You can see rain clouds, and, and you can feel the south wind blow, but you can't see the clouds of grace, and you can't sense the wind of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, you're lost. 
You pay more attention to the constantly changing weather conditions than you do about the things of the Lord. You cannot see that Messiah is standing right in front of you. You're so caught up in the material, you cannot even perceive that there is something called spiritual. And Jesus is saying, that's why you cannot even see who I am. You see the, you see the weather, but you can't even sense what it's really all about. In verse 57, interestingly, he says, yes, and, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? Why are you letting others direct the way you think about me? Why are you not making up your own mind instead of allowing others to influence you away from me? It's like that time we were recently speaking about this when Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who is influencing you? There are people even in churches like this, and this church it's happened more than once, where, where I have given an invitation and, and people have actually, had, we've had in the past, we had a, a, a young man and his girlfriend actually getting in a fight in, in one of the pews in the back because I gave an invitation and she wanted to go forward and he was fighting with her and, and getting angry at her during the whole time, you know, that she, I want to go for it. No, you don't go for it. And they were fighting in church. It was Mike and Noreen Callahan. I was very, <laughs> very upset over it. I, I told him I wouldn't say it, but I had to. No, it's, no, I mean, that has happened. That has happened. Where, and, and some of you have experienced that, where, where the Spirit of the Lord is saying, you need to get right, but somebody's whispering in your ear. Did you receive Christ the first time you heard the gospel? Did you have anybody tell you, come on, don't get so upset over that. Don't get into that. Years ago, years ago, when we used to meet in Ontario on Maple Street, I was given a Bible study in uh, 1 Corinthians. And as I was going through the passage, it spoke concerning certain sins. And there were a variety of sins, including the sin of homosexuality. So as is my normal process, I gave as full a teaching as I could and spoke about those, those things that, that Paul was writing about. The next week, I, I talked to a young lady who gave her heart to Christ. And she said to me, I was here on Wednesday night when you were teaching on homosexuality. She said, I was with my girlfriend. She says, because I've been practicing lesbianism. And as I had opened the Bible, like you said, and began to read along with you, and you began to explain, explain those verses, she said, I began to listen carefully to it. And as I listened to it, I was convinced that that's what the Bible actually said concerning what I was. She said, I left the church service, and my girlfriend and I were driving back to our place. And my girl says to me, that's his opinion. That's not really true. That's his opinion. She said, but you know what? She said, I looked at it, and I thought about it. She said, even prayed about it. She said, and as I looked at it, I, I told her, that's not true. That's exactly what that passage is saying. She says, I want you to know, I left my girlfriend this week. I've deci decided to follow Jesus Christ. That young lady now lives in Oregon, and she's married and raising a family because the Word of God has a way of setting you free. Instead of letting other people tell you, the Holy Spirit is telling you. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. Why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? You're listening to what the Pharisees have to say, the religious experts of your time, the scribes. Here I am standing right in front of you. You see the way that weather is in its natural sense. Why are you not seeing who I am? Don't let other people influence you away from Jesus Christ. He says in verses 58 and 59, closing, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge. The judge deliver you to the officer. The officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. If you're taken to human court, don't you think it wise to try to settle quickly? Don't you want to settle before you stand before the judge? Try to settle out of court. Because if you can avoid being dragged before a judge... That's a good thing because that judge may not side with you. Well, you have a heavenly judge, a judge who will judge you 
entirely fairly based on your merit. You're going to be found guilty. You're going to be judged, and you will never be set free. From this, you will have no hope of ever being set free, so you need to settle your accounts now. Settle your accounts with the Lord now because it's too late when you stand before him in judgment. It is appointed unto men to die once, but after this, judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. But Jesus said, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. And so, if I hear what Jesus is saying and receive him, then I am not going to stand before him as the righteous judge because I have already received his forgiveness. And he will not condemn me, for I have been ruled innocent through him. But if I do not have the wisdom to receive that which he's already offered me, then when I stand before him, all I can receive from him is the righteous judgment. And as he says in verse 59, you shall not depart from there till you've paid the very last mite. In other words, you're not going to depart at all because you'll never be able to pay all that you owe. So, it's wise to settle accounts before you stand before that judge.